Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. We hope you enjoy the talk. Thank you for that very generous introduction. Um, I hope that the rest of the talk will now be able to live up to that. Um, and I'm delighted to be here in Edinburgh. I always love coming to visit. I always love doing research. I've, um, every time I come back, there's more material for me to look at, and I discover new and exciting things. And that's been very much the case with this project, um, which is part of a larger project on the worlds of Burke and Hare. Um, I realize that the Burke and Hare case is, I'm sure, very familiar to many of you. Uh, I'm going to, therefore, present it in a, perhaps a way you haven't seen before by presenting it as though it was a CSI. Uh, I'm a CSI junkie. I don't know how many of you are familiar with any of the variants of the series. Is there anybody here who watches? Yes? A few of you? Okay. The rest of you, please bear with me. Uh, I'll try to explain some of the ways that it works. It's a series of, about featuring the forensic labs um, in, actually, there are three different labs in three different cities um, in the United States. And it always follows a set format. You always start out by seeing pictures of the city. So um, we're going to start out there. This is a picture of, I, I can't zoom in, unfortunately, the way it does in the TV show. This is a picture of Edinburgh actually from about 1875, but if you ignore the Scott Monument and the puff of train smoke in the distance, it would have been pretty much what you would have seen in um, on October 31st, uh, 1828. Um, and we're actually going to start over here in the Pleasance. And that's where um, Maggie Dougherty, or Dufty, or Duffy, or Campbell, um, I get the, the name Dougherty or Dufty, I'm guessing it would have been pronounced Dufty, was her, her maiden name. Uh, and Campbell was her husband's name, as she explained to everybody that she uh, met. Um, that's where she came on, as I say, this October 31st. She was looking for her son, who had come to Edinburgh to work um, in the harvest. She was from Ireland. But when she got to the boarding house, where she expected to meet him, um, she unfortunately didn't find him there. She did, however, find a friend of his, and she decided that she would head home. Um, and so she walked down the Pleasance. He took her to St. Mary's Wind, which would have been somewhere up here, and left her. And she continued on the Cowgate, Again, sort of following this path, which is a little bit hard to see from here, to the grass market. And uh, this is a picture of the grass market from her point of view as she's walking towards it. Now, I love these pictures. They were done by artists in the end of the 19th century at the time when Edinburgh was um, being rebuilt in many ways. And they sort of capture a certain picturesque view. But for this particular day, they are uh, not quite accurate because this was October 31st. This was Halloween Day. And the next day, November 1st, was the day of the biggest agricultural fair in Edinburgh. And Edinburgh was the center, the entrepot, of a major agricultural market. So it would have been crowded with people and carts and animals all thronging into the grass market. Um, and uh, I don't really have a picture of it during the day. Halloween itself was uh, the evening was a big party, a big block party, until well into the 19th century. This is a picture from the end of the 19th century. Again, it's a little dark, but you can see the castle and you can see the booths and so forth. And, uh, and apparently things got, got you know, very lively. And so I'm thinking it was like, um, I'm from New York, Times Square, uh, the, the day of New Year's Eve, with everybody coming in. And I'm emphasizing that because... Maggie Doggerty, as I'm going to call her, has sometimes been represented as a little old woman, a sort of a waif, wandering through the deserted streets of Edinburgh. And I try where I can to give agency to people, uh, in this case, as you may know, as a victims um, of uh, Burke and Hare. And so it seems to me she wasn't, she probably was not very old, she's probably my age. Um, and uh, she was not waif-like, she was traveling into a crowded area where she would expect to find someone who could maybe invite her to, for a meal, um, who, where she could maybe get a, a ride part of the way home. She was heading into the Irish district um, of the West Port. Uh, she, this was Edinburgh. She had no particular reason to fear assault. Actually, any kind of assault to strangers was unusual in the city. And she was poor. 
So she didn't really have too much reason to fear theft. I don't know how many of you um, have ever been hitchhiking. Um, back in the day when I used to go hitchhiking, there were sort of tricks that you learned if you wanted to go from one place to another. And you learned to be very friendly and open and often people would you know, do things like take you home to lunch and drive you to your next spot, you know, the next tourist site that you wanted to go to. And so that's the way I think of her. I think that she was looking for a way of getting home and looking for a ride home and looking for maybe a handout on the way among people that she expected to, uh, to find as friends. And so she headed to the Irish district, which is the West Port. Um, again, it later took on a, uh, you know, a horrific connotation. But it really was just the western part of the city. It was the western suburb. It was an immigrant district. But there's no sign that it was a slum or, again, that assaults were particularly common. There'd be no reason for her to expect it. The main street, Western Portsboro, had churches, had a bookseller shop, a lending library, uh, lots of tanneries, lots of shoemakers. And, you know, it was a major, it was a corridor, um, as you would find going in and out of any city. And, again, this is a sort of deserted picture of it, and some of you may recognize the spot, but it actually looks, I think, a little less unsavory in this picture than perhaps it would if I showed you the modern version. And there's the, there's the castle up on top. And so that's where she went. Um, and she uh, went into a grocery shop to ask for something to drink and maybe for a handout of some kind. And there she met a man, uh, very, also from Ireland, who she started to chat with. Doherty, he said to her, your name's Doherty. My mother's name is Doggerty. What a coincidence. Why don't you come back home? I'll, you know, my wife will get you some breakfast. You can stay with us. You know, uh, why don't you stay for, for Halloween, and then you can be on your way when you're ready. And she was delighted to do that. And if this was a CSI, we would now stop here, and we would cut to the medical district in Edinburgh. This is a picture of uh, Surgeon Square, and you have to now imagine it with black and yellow crime scene tape surrounding it. And uh, you can also now imagine Catherine Willows and Gus Grissom turning up. And Willows says to Grissom, who called it in? And Grissom says, woman in the West Port found a body under the bed. And Willows said, well, if a body was found in the West Port, what are we doing in Surgeon Square? And Grissom would say, pausing, as he always does, Catherine, Whenever a body goes missing in Edinburgh, the first place you look is always Surgeon's Square. OK. Well, as most of you know, what the discovery of that body did was set off an investigation. Um, and what was uncovered was a series of 16 murders carried out between November 1827 and October 31st, 1828. So Maggie Doherty's murder was the last murder in the series. Uh, the murderers were William Burke and William Hare. Um, probably with the assistance of Margaret Laird, um, that's Hare's wife, and Nellie McDougall, who lived with Burke as his wife. Um, the cadavers during that period, where the purpose for the murders was to sell the cadavers. The cadavers were sold to um, Dr. Robert Knox, who was an anatomy lecturer in Edinburgh. Um, they were discovered, they were called in, when two people, I'm going to get back to them, whose names were Anne and James Gray, who had been lodging with Burke, um, got suspicious and looked under the bed and found a body. They uh, quickly went for the police. By the time the police got there, the body was gone. And that's a, a point about the later investigation I'm going to get back to. Um, but as I've indicated, it did turn up in Surgeon Square. Um, during the subsequent investigation, Hare agreed to turn King's evidence. And so Hare and Margaret Laird were the principal witnesses against the Burke and McDougall, who were put on trial December 24th, 1828. The trial lasted uh, 24 hours, and it went straight through, no breaks. Um, the verdict for McDougall was not proven, um, and so she was released, but for Burke it was guilty. Um, and he was executed on January 28th in 1829. Now, I'm a medical historian. I do have a kind of a uh, fondness for the seamy underside of Edinburgh medical life. I'm not quite sure what that means. I got interested in this because, in fact, when I was working on the Le Sassier book, he was a friend of Robert Knox. And I thought that working with him gave me some insight into what Knox uh, might have been up to. Um, but I, I soon found that there were a number of other questions I was interested in, including the one I'm going to talk to you today. 
which is just what was the level of forensic knowledge, of what would have been called medical legal knowledge in Edinburgh at the time. Um, and I, the reason I was interested in that is because I was struck with how there seemed to be very clear procedures that were followed. And I did a lot of research with the various procedures in a number of different murder cases. There aren't very many of them, but there are enough uh, to, to try to get a sense of, of why, what the procedure was, why it was being followed. Um, and what was really struck me was how well worked out the whole thing was. I mean, the, the criminal investigators were not improvising. They clearly had a procedure, and I wondered what it was. And this was very striking to me, particularly when I went to look into um, the history of forensic science. Uh, not an area I was expert on by any means. And what struck me is that very little from this period has found its way into the standard textbooks on the history of forensic science. Um, usually they will mention the Roman physician, Antistius, who examined the body of Julius Caesar. And then they'll kind of skip really quickly onto the Chinese work, Collected Cases of Injustice Rectified, written in 1287. And then... You know, we go over some large number of centuries until we get to fingerprinting, um, we get to um, teeth, you know, forensic odontology, we get to bugs, we get to DNA. And if the early 19th century gets mentioned at all, it gets mentioned in a connection with Matthias Orfila, who's the Spanish uh, toxicologist who taught at the um, University of Paris and is in just this era. Um, but mostly people don't even mention that. It's often, uh, this period is often treated as though it's a complete black hole in the history of forensics. And in some popular works, they'll even say, well, in this period, nobody was interested in forensics. No one took it seriously, and so on. So um, I don't think that's true. I think it was taken very seriously. I think particularly it was taken very seriously in, uh, in Edinburgh. Um, and it's very clear that far from being a despised or ignored science, that the High Court of Justiciary, particularly in Edinburgh, um, took the forensic evidence, again, the, using that as a shorthand, medical evidence, very seriously indeed. Um, now, I want to illustrate just the procedure that was followed. As I said, it was a well-worked-out procedure. Let's go back to Maggie Dougherty, last seen here um, in Surgeon Square. She had been transported in a tea chest, uh, and she was put back in that tea chest, and she was moved to the police office in the high street. It, it was then examined, of course, not by Grissom or Willows, but it was examined by Alexander Black, surgeon to the police establishment. Formerly, the Edinburgh Police, as again, many of you I'm sure know, was a new institution in the early 19th century. Um, it had been established in 1805, but it seems to have built upon the very ancient tradition of watchmen within the city. And generally, uh, ha it's very noteworthy, seems to have had a good reputation. All kinds of people, not just the, the elite, go to the police. In fact, in some ways, it was not the elite, but it was the ordinary tradesmen and so forth who would go for the, for the police. Um, that's not true about immigrants to the city. Um, so that's an ex they t typically did not go for the to the to the police. Um, that's an interesting thing, and we could maybe talk about it later. Uh, but generally, as I say, the the police does seem to have a good reputation among um, city residents. Originally, in the 1820s, it, it was really in transition. It was charged with all. It was, it was a, a branch of the city administration. It was charged with anything that fell under the umbrella of keeping the city free of nuisances. So it collected the dung, the excrement, from, uh, from houses. And in fact, that was where it, it got a certain amount of its revenue, because uh, it was sold as, as fertilizer. It, the, it was the police who were involved in laying out the gas lights of the city. They were involved in the, in the water. They were involved in rounding up vagrants um, if they uh, were held to be infesting the streets of the city. Um, but by the 1820s, increasingly, they start to look more like a modern police force. And they had just appointed in the early 20s two officers who were specifically charged with criminal investigation. So it was an institution in transition. And the position of police surgeon was also an institution in transition. Uh, originally, the police surgeon was the kind of frontline medic there in case any of the, uh, any of the men got hurt or alternately in case anybody else got hurt and the, the police surgeon would be called. Um, because most murder cases began as assault cases, that is, it was really unusual for a murder case to start when you discover the body. 
Usually a murder case started when there was a fight in the street and somebody got hit a little too hard and was lying bleeding on the cobblestones and, and, uh, and the surgeon would be called and would have to take evidence about what happened and then the uh, victim would be taken to the Royal Infirmary and later died. So most murder cases, as I said, started as assault. And that meant that the police surgeon was usually the first medical person on the scene um, and adopted the role or, or took on the role of keeping track of what might be necessary, used later in evidence for a criminal case. Um, Alexander Black, who was the police surgeon in this period, is a little hard to find out. It's hard to find out too much information about him. But I think his family history kind of shows a little bit about the transition that the position was going through. Um, I just found an Alexander Black in the, uh, in the um, baptismal records today, and it could be him. Uh, if it was, his father was a gentleman servant in the college. Uh, there's also an Alexander Black who took some courses in anatomy in the 1790s. Uh, and again, that would make sense. This Alexander Black, we know, never got his degree. But he had a son who got a medical degree by the 1820s, got a medical degree from uh, Edinburgh University, took courses on, uh, criminal, on medical jurisprudence. So you can kind of see within the generations that there is a, a, an increased professionalization. There's a sense that, again, the medical man, who was once just a general medical man, is now specializing um, in becoming expert in, in medical jurisprudence. Um, okay, well, Black examined Maggie Dougherty's body at the police station. He did not find any bruises or wounds of any consequence. Her face was swollen, he recorded, and of a blackish hue. Her eyes were swollen, too. There was blood about her nose and there was saliva, but Black could not find any cuts on the face that would explain it. So he then went with some police officers to the alleged crime scene, which was the room in the West Port where the two witnesses, Anne and James Gray, had first reported the body. Um, what Black found there was a quantity of blood mixed with about 15 or 16 ounces of saliva. Uh, Black was told that the woman had laid in that place and therefore concluded that the saliva must have come from her mouth or nose. Uh, and there's various points to be made about that. One small point I will introduce here is just that uh, when asked about the blood, one of the residents in the house, Nellie McDougall, had said that it came from about two weeks earlier, a woman who had, who had menstruated while she was sleeping in the bed. Um, but then you wouldn't expect to find saliva. Uh, and certainly, again, you wouldn't expect to find fresh saliva. Um, so I want to point that out to you. It's a, it's a very precise kind of description. It's clearly intended to link the cadaver found in Surgeon Square with this spot in the West Port. And it's also very precise as far as quantities. Uh, it's not just that he found blood and saliva, but that he found 15 or 16 ounces of saliva. And it's not the only case where we see that. In fact, it's the, that's the rule rather than the exception. Um, we can see the same attention to quantity and measurement in a later murder case when Black was called to what proved to be a fatal stabbing off the high street. Again, when he's called, he didn't know it was going to be fatal. Um, he found a woman, Mrs. Gao, in the stairwell, lying on the floor, all covered with blood. And when he examined her, he found a large incised wound betwixt the third and fourth rib, which perforated the thorax. Likewise, an incised wound on her right and left arm. One of the bystanders showed him a shoemaker's knife on which there was some blood, and having measured the wounds, Black was of opinion that they had been inflicted with the said knife, and he marked it. And thanks to the uh, Museum of the Royal College of Surgeons, I can show you the knife. That is the knife that, that Alexander Black found on this case. Um, blood was issuing profusely from the wounds, Black stated, and he considered her to be in the greatest danger. Again, he had to mark that. He had to write that down in his report in case she died later. He asked her how she got herself so severely hurt, and she said she had been stabbed by Gao, her husband, and thought she was dying. Another stabbing victim, Alexander Polson, was sitting on a chair in the same apartment supported by two people and vomiting much. Black found he had a large wound on the leg, all bleeding most profusely, and considered him to be in the greatest danger as well. He compared the same knife to Polson's wounds and was of opinion that they had also been inflicted by it. Polson, too, stated that Gao stabbed him and that he conceived he was dying. Black dressed their wounds and sent them to the infirmary, and when they both died, the husband, James Gow, was charged with murder. And uh, not only did the Royal College of Surgeons kindly um, uh, keep the knife, they kept some body parts. Uh, this is the heart. This is Mrs. Gow's heart. And if you want to see a comparison, 
I think you can see very clearly that the knife does appear to have, you could certainly make a case that the knife uh, has inflicted that wound. Um, we can note that there's not really much detection that's necessary here. After all, when Black came, um, there were the victims, there was the alleged perpetrator, there was the knife, there was an awful lot of blood. They live long enough to accuse the victim. I mean, even, uh, even for a Scottish court, which was very, very strict about, about when it would um, uh, bring in a degree of guilty in, in a homicide case, that was probably enough. And we can also note that if somebody else had committed the crime, that is, somebody else had stabbed the two people, then, you know, handed the knife to Gao and ran from the scene, no one was going to be able to use forensics to, to, to find that out. Um, but still, uh, again, I, with the, that even now, although in the CSIs, they're forever doing all kinds of detection, most actual functioning criminalists um, in real life don't find that one clue that uh, implicates a completely unknown person. It's much more common for the um, evidence to be used to corroborate or to, uh, or to counter a story, uh, a, a testimony from, um, from a suspect. And so that's really very standard to the way that forensic knowledge is put to use today. Um, and again, it's very striking to me because it's supposed to be the dark ages of forensics, and here there's all of this attention to this. Um, okay, what's also striking is that things didn't stop with black. Uh, once a uh, body had been brought in had, and murder was suspected, then the public prosecutor, who was typically the Lord Advocate in this period, Sir William Ray, appointed two medical inspectors to examine the body. And they, were, they acted as independent experts. They, were not, they might have been brought by the Crown, by the prosecution, but they were supposed to give an independent testimony. Um, in the case of Manji Dougherty, the two inspectors were William Newbinging, who was a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons. He was very experienced in this. He call, was called in, for a, in, a lot of, um, in a lot of murder cases. And Robert Christensen, who was the professor of medical jurisprudence. Uh, Christensen is, in my mind, a very interesting choice because he had studied with Orfila, and he was actually best known as a toxicologist, and that's what he published on. So my guess is that it originally, because since Black couldn't find any sign of assault to indicate where the person died, that they thought that they may have thought there may have been some thought that she had died of poisoning. Um, Christensen did examine the stomach, but found little there except about a pint of grayish pulp, like half-digested porridge, entirely free of any spirituous or narcotic odor. Um, the skull, brain, and other internal organs were all perfectly natural, and only the liver showed early signs of the incipient stage of what he called the disease of drunkards. The most important sign of trauma they uncovered was during the examination of the spine, consisting of the rupture of nearly the whole posterior ligament connections between the third and fourth vertebrae. As Christensen later wrote, they were first disposed to look upon the laceration of the spine as an injury produced during life and adequate to produce death. Um, but as they examined it more closely, it didn't seem to fit the pattern of other contusions on the body. Christensen went to the medical literature. And again, if you've seen CSIs, this is the first thing you do. Um, but he couldn't find anything that seemed to answer the case. So what he did next was he and his colleagues took three fresh cadavers and started to experiment. I have to tell you, I'm really struck by this. Under the circumstances, I would like to know where those cadavers came from. I mean, how did they happen to come up with these three? But, and they didn't say, Christensen didn't say in his account, but he did make, take pains to explain exactly what each of them had died of. Um, in any case, what he did then is he took these cadavers and he subjected them to a variety of blows to try to simulate the diseases, and sorry, the, the, the uh, contusions that had been found on Dougherty's body. Uh, and after doing this and after um, studying the cadavers over a period of 24 hours, um, they were able to replicate the appearance of trauma, um, the tearing of the ligaments of the vertebrae and the effusion of blood into the spinal canal. They therefore came to the conclusion that the marks of contusions on Dougherty's body were almost certainly inflicted during life, but they were not, they couldn't be 
said to be the cause of death, but that the injury of the spine might have been caused after death, and they were fairly precise that they might have been caused within 17 um, hours after death as well as during life. So that in the, their opinion was that rather than having produced the cause of death, being the cause of death, it had been produced by packing that body into the T-chest, that that's when the ligaments had torn. And again, what I want to call your attention to at this point is not so much the conclusion, but the procedure Christensen and Newbingen went through to investigate the cause of death. Again, there's a lot of precision, and Christensen later wrote this kind of stuff up and said, you always have to be precise. Conjectural estimates and comparisons, however common, even in medical legal inspections, are quite inadmissible. He wrote like that. Um, but no, it's not just that. He, they, the two medical inspectors carried out experiments to recreate the injuries found on the cadaver and determine cause of death. They used up three presumably quite scarce cadavers to do this, and I assume at their own expense. I don't know if they were reimbursed. And the question is why? I mean, what was driving this kind of precision? this kind of interest. And when I've given versions of this talk before to, to an American audience, I was actually asked that question, and I didn't really have an answer. I just said, well, people in Edinburgh are really smart. And, and it was suggested to me that although that's probably, I mean, that's certainly true, that perhaps I could come up with something a little more historic. Um, so I looked into it, and one of the things that strikes me uh, the obvious point is to look at the role that the um, investigation played in judicial procedure of the period. And it's not a leap for me to do this because in many, many of the criminal records as the procurator fiscal put together his case, he would be in fairly constant communication with the Solicitor General or the Lord Advocate. Uh, and in some cases, the Lord Advocate even went to the bench to try to get a sense of what, to, about what would be the lo good line of investigation to take. Now, in talking about Scott's Law, which I am going to now do, I have to say, uh, I, to ask your indulgence, I'm very much an outsider. I am not a scholar of Scott's Law, and indeed, I'm not at all familiar with it from my own lived experience. Um, but again, these are just things that, that strike me, and if anybody in the audience will have suggestions at the end of other air avenues that I can, that I can follow up on, uh, I'd be very pleased to hear about it. Um, one point that I think should be made, just in case anybody here is, is taking it for granted, is that the Scottish legal procedure was amazingly equitable uh, and amazingly concerned for the rights of the accused by the standards of the day. It is phenomenal to have the judges and the prosecutors you know, and the defense discuss, deb discuss and debate for hours about what is the best, the most humane way to protect the rights of the accused. Uh, and I think it's very noteworthy in the Burke and Hare case. Again, as many of you know, they were Burke and, and McDougal were defended by the best lawyers. And there was, a, there was a, the political considerations involved, but even so, they were defended by the best lawyers um, in Edinburgh at the time. And it, you know, it is, it's, uh, it's, it's very striking to me, so I think that needs to be said. I don't, unfortunately, have a picture of the courtroom in um, Edinburgh from the period. So this is actually a London <laughs> court trial, but I, I think it kind of conveys, again, this sense of, uh, of a very strict, very standard judicial procedure. Now, the particular area that it strikes me that medical evidence could be helpful in uh, was when it corroborated the testimony of the socii criminis, that is to say, the partners in crime. Again, many criminal investigations in this period relied on informants. They relied on somebody in the gang turning King's evidence. But again, Scott's law was very strict. You could not just introduce, I don't even think you could introduce, let alone try to get a conviction, based on the testimony of a, a partner in crime, because the objection could very readily be made that he or she was simply saving his or her own skin by turning against, against uh um, a culprit. And certainly that case could be made in the Burke and Hare case and was and was made very definitely. But it was considered to be admissible in court if corroborated, that is the testimony of associates, um, if corroborated in some points and if it appeared to be consistent with itself and with other proof. Um, so the medical evidence could serve a very useful purpose for the prosecution in corroborating the report, uh, the, the um, uh, account, the testimony of the socius, of the partner in crime. And in fact, um, that's one of the things that Christensen said about uh, his own evidence. Again, the medical um, examiners had looked at the body, 
before anybody had taken any kind of testimony. They were not, they were aware, uh, they had reason to believe that, they, that it was a murder, but they had no idea what the testimony was going to be. So their evidence submitted independently corroborated what Hare um, later, later testified to. Um, the specific appearances uh, were contusions, bloodshot eyes. You know, when Doc Robbins talks about petechial hemorrhage, that's what he's talking about. Um, and the scarf skin under the chin much, uh, much ruffled. Um, the hyoid bone in the neck and the thyroid cartilage was much further apart than usual in consequence of stretching of their interposed ligaments. Um, and as, Herod, as Christensen sorry, testified, they, they would justify a suspicion of death by suffocation in which the hand is applied under the chin on the throat and pressure is made upwards and laterally at the same time in consequence of appearance of the cuticle under the skin. So this and this. I can't do, you can't do it on yourself. I wouldn't say try this at home either, but I think you get the idea. Um, and that's exactly what Hare later testified. I mean, that's exactly as he described what later happened. Um, and we have here, this is from the William Ruffhead uh, collection in the Signet Library in Edinburgh. And this is actually Christensen's own copy of the trial of Burke and Hare as it was later published. And, and he, he thought it was uh, extremely good. Um, I also have, this is, this is something Christensen wrote about 10 years later together with a couple of other people, suggestions on the medical legal examination of dead bodies. And it was later frequently reprinted as a kind of a handbook to the medical man called out to be a medical examiner. Because it was usually the first medical man who was in the area. Was, you know, the, the bodies couldn't be kept uh, in a freezer anywhere. So, uh, so this was to, give, to, to serve as a kind of a handbook. Now, the thing is, though, I mean, that, you can, that explains why the prosecution would be interested in, um, in medical legal examination. But the problem is that it could sometimes blow their case wide open. And um, again, I speak as an outsider, but it seems to me that the, the distinctively Scott's verdict, not proven, uh, gave an opportunity or gave a reason why the defense might be interested in medical testimony as well, because if the Crown made the testimony of the medical investigators a significant part of their case, then by attacking that testimony or suggesting that there were problems with it, then a, a defense lawyer might be able to convince a jury that the case was not proven. And I always have to explain to an American audience, not proven doesn't mean um, we're guil you're guilty, but we can't prove it. It means, again, it's a, it means, strictly speaking, the case has not been proven. There is doubt about whether the prosecution has made its case. I'm going to go quickly through the next case. There is, again, this is one where, again, a body was found. A, uh, a Jewish fur dealer, Alexander Phillips, who was resident in Edinburgh, um, went out one day in July 3rd, 1827, and he was never heard from again. He'd been quarreling with his father about some jewelry he had bought from a man in Leith, and he'd gone to take it back. When he left um, home, he was carrying perhaps 200 pounds in banknotes and another 50 pounds in gold, as well as several watches and a silver snuff box. And what he was doing, going down to Leith with all of that, I mean, you don't want to blame the victim, but still, you know, but still, is my New York analogy. You know, you don't go to Times Square with that amount of money, um, even now. Uh, so in any case, he disappeared. Um, his father grew anxious about him. He was an immigrant. He did not go to the police. Um, and uh, a few days later, the body turned up in a uh, field of oats and a path outside of Leith. Um, again, I'm going to kind of skip over some of the gorier details about the investigation. The police didn't have very much to go on. Um, and so Philip's father called in a kind of private inquiry agent, Moses Leisenheim, to investigate his son's death. Leisenheim set up a, a sting, we're again working with the police, set up a sting operation with the suspects who were actually a police officer and his wife, um, but who were suspected of receiving stolen goods. And they did manage to find the goods on, uh, again, McMahon is the man's name, um, and he and his wife were taken into custody, uh, charged with the crime, uh, with the crime of murder, and brought into court. Many of the valuables that had belonged to Phillips were found in their flat, and so there seemed to be good reason for assuming that they had they were responsible for the body, and for Phillips' death. 
The pro again, Black had been the first one, as usual, to examine the body, um, and the two people who were brought in as medical inspectors were experienced surge, uh, surgeons, William Brown and Alexander Watson. Um, they testified that they believed that uh, uh, Phillips had met a death by unfair uh, means. His limbs were plump and firm. Um, there was no sign that there was any kind of illness, uh, no pathological signs. Um, what there was of the body, because the brain was in such a state of decay, being almost fluid, so that it was impossible to ascertain the existence of any disease. Um, again, every and all the... All the medical evidence pointed to Phillips having been perfectly healthy when he left home that day. The question was whether it indicated a, a convincingly death by violence. There was no sign of a blow to the head. There was no sign of any other wound, and again, an incised wound that would have, um, that would have uh, made a, a uh, conclusion of murder conclusive. They were left with strangulation or suffocation is the most likely form of homicide. Um, the problem was, again, that the body was very decomposed, so they couldn't find, they looked very carefully for marks around the neck, for anything that would have indicated a ligature, uh, and, uh, and none of that was possible. The face and neck were so much disfigured that they could not ascertain whether there were marks of strangulation or other violence. Um, the problem was also the maggots, um, because if there had been any blood upon the face, as one of the surgeons testified, it would have been eaten off by the maggots along with the exterior surfaces of the skin. And so it could not be dis discovered whether there had been any injury of the flesh or skin so as to allow blood to escape or not. The surgeons were asked point blank, could they tell how long the body had been lying there? But this was several centuries before the body farm, and the answer is no, they unfortunately could not tell. They gave an estimation of between four and five days. Uh, and the lack of precision weakened the case very clearly, as did the lack of any shred of evidence linking the accused to the dead body. That is, they had the goods, but there was no evidence to connect them to the body itself. Um, the prosecution did the best it could. The victim might have been strangled for aught you can say, the medical witnesses were asked by the court. He might. Um, he was a stout man, one of the surgeons replied. But that was easily countered by the defense during cross-examination. When you say that for aught you know he might have been strangled, we are to understand, of course, that for aught you can tell, he might not have been strangled, asked the defense counsel. Certainly, Brown replied. You cannot say whether he might not have died of apoplexy. Always a safe bet, right, because you couldn't prove apoplexy one way or the other. The defense attorney continued, no, replied Brown, I cannot. And that settled the matter. The Lloyd advocate, in his address to the court, had to admit that he had no case for murder. There were strong grounds, he said, for thinking that the man had been murdered. Um, there was pregnant suspicion of a murder having been committed and committed by the accused at the bar. But from the medical evidence, it was too narrow a case against them. Um, as what formed the first inquiry in every case of this kind, the cause of death was left in uncertainty. And again, I'm just you know, stunned by this, the Lord Advocate standing up in court and saying, I'm sorry, I guess we don't have a case after all. Um, the jury were not happy, and they wanted to deliberate further, but uh, the Chief Justice Clark said, no, um, you cannot do that. Legally, you cannot touch a hair of the prisoner's head. So the case the, um, of uh, the indictment for murder against the prisoners was simply dropped. Uh, they did not get off scot-free um, because there was a second charge that was brought against them of theft and reset of theft for the stolen goods, and they were um, sentenced for transportation. But still, the murder, the murder case itself collapsed, again, specifically because of the medical evidence. Now, one of the other things that I find really fascinating about all of these cases that I look at is it's not just the lawyers or the doctors that are interested in these things and seem to have an amazing fund of knowledge about medical legal stuff. Um, it seems like ordinary people, witnesses in murder trials, um, neighbors, friends, uh, seem to have a striking awareness of the importance of physical evidence. And this lay understanding was demonstrated time and time again in murder trials. And I think it's as though, you know, the aunts and uncles of Sherlock Holmes 
um, because it was about the generation before him, all seemed to be living in the closes and the wines of Edinburgh, ready to kind of pop out and keep track of the bloody knives and the, you know, and the acid and so forth. Um, in one case where uh, a bunch of neighbors, well, I, there was a quarrel between um, two people living in adjoining flats, and uh, one woman had been heard to threaten her neighbor, her, her, sorry, her neighbor, Archibald Campbell, um, and uh, subsequently he was attacked on the stairs with acid. And the downstairs neighbor, who was a goldsmith, heard about this, called to his son to call out the window, because of course they're high up, you know, in, a, in one of the, the uh, tenements, to call out to, to get the police and to tell, he, he said to his son, tell the policeman to come put a, a guard on the door so that nobody can get out. And he ran upstairs uh, where the wife of the attacked man, Mrs. Campbell, had already been to get, get her husband. Um, the goldsmith, his name is Robertson, uh, very carefully marked the um, presence of the acid. He marked the directionality of the drops and the fact that they seemed to go directly to the door of the neighbor who had been heard to threaten his friend Campbell uh, and there to stop. He um, ascertained by touching the liquid that it was in fact acid, which he said he knew exactly what it was because he, um, he worked with it as a goldsmith and he, he said precisely muriatic acid, oral of vitriol. Um, the police officer actually later when he came was able to find a broken uh, jug outside the window of the alleged perpetrators that also had some acid that tasted uh, a little bit sour. Um, Robertson went back to test Campbell's uh, clothes to see if it was acid actually uh, on the clothes and so forth. Um, so there's a very striking attention to all of this evidence to build up, build up a case. Uh, Campbell actually was taken to the Royal Infirmary. He did later die. The medical witnesses actually could not testify that he died as a result of the acid. Uh, in their opinion, he had died as, as a result of an infection received from bloodletting. But the neighbor who had thrown the acid was nonetheless convicted because it, was, it had been recently made a capital offense to throw acid of any sort with the intention of, it, of hurting or maiming. And there was no difficulty proving that very clearly, that the acid had been in their possession, that the, you know, the, the drop showed that it had gone from their house to the corridor and so forth. Um, now cases, again, I like to call that the case of the intelligent goldsmith. Um, Cases where neighbors tracked on clues, made valuable suggestions, gave clear testimony, were really common, and they turn up all the time in the Crown Office archives. And again, when I've talked about that before, I've been asked, why? How did people know about this stuff? And I trotted out the people in Edinburgh are smart. I think it's fair to say, you know, it's good to remember that it's not just the professionals who are smart. It's not just doctors and lawyers who are smart. You can have people who are goldsmiths uh, or, you know, wives, daughters, whoever, who are smart. Um, but in fact, legal knowledge was very widely dispersed, again, among the native uh, Scots population of Edinburgh. That's clear uh, from some of Sir Walter Scott's uh, novels. And also, I was able to answer that a little bit, I think, by using the marvelous resource of the National Library of Scotland. Um, oh, there we are. Uh, broadsheets, which is up on their website, and you can search by word, you can search by murder, Burke, whatever, and you can search by Mr. Black, police surgeon to the uh, oh, sorry, surgeon to the police establishment. And what you find, I mean, many of the broadsheets, if you've looked at them at all, you'll know they're full of pictures, and the, the National uh, Library of Scotland emphasizes that. These were the, this was the word on the street. These would have been sold for a penny. They would have been available in uh, you know, the poorer sections of town to anyone who could read. But the, there are four that um, cite black specifically. They cite Newbingen. They cite Christensen. They give really very detailed pictures of uh, very detailed accounts of the medical evidence. I'm sorry, it's impossible to read like this. Frankly, I think it would probably be very difficult to read even if you had it in front of you without a magnifying glass. But again, I think that's one of the explanations that can be given for why people made good witnesses is because this kind of knowledge was more pervasive than we might have suspected. Uh, it's not just a question of, um, of, again, elite knowledge. It seems to have descended fairly um, freely down the, down, down the social ladder. 
I would like to say that it bubbled up from below the social, uh, the, from, from the bottom up as well. Steve, as Steve said, that's the kind of thing I like to talk about, but, uh, but I, I can't quite show that yet. And with this in mind, we should return to the Burke and Hare case, and we should remember that it was not a doctor and not the police who first broke the case, but it was ordinary neighbors. It was Anne and James Gray, and this is a much later artist representation of their looking under the, the, um, the bed. Why did they look under the bed? Anne Gray noticed that she was being kept away from a bed where she kept her things, and she wondered why. She thought there was something suspicious. Now, she, and what she said when she was left alone in the room with her husband, now I will see the mystery. They lifted up the straw, and as they later described, and what they saw was the dead woman lying naked under the bed on her right side with her face to the wall. Um, James Gray lifted the head by the hair and later testified, and they saw the face a little over with blood about the mouth and on one side of her head. And the Gray's testimony was essential to the prosecution. Again, it corroborated the, um, the testimony of the Sosius, and it corroborated the testimony of Alexander Black, the surgeon, that he'd found blood and saliva there. But they're the ones that actually put the, the body at the crime scene. Um, so they were essential. And uh, James Gray was actually given a position with the police as a kind of reward for, for this. Uh, most contemporary accounts, as you can see in this picture, make Anne the heroine of the story. And if you like Sherlock Holmes, you'll be pleased to hear that she smoked a pipe. Um, which is not depicted in this. Um, now, if there's one group where, who, who did not seem to be aware of the intricacies of forensic evidence, it's really the murderers themselves. Um, and, of course, they were in an awkward position. They knew there had been a murder, and they had to quickly come up with some reason, some account for the, for the death. Um, William Burke made several statements in prison. Uh, the second one he made, the first one he denied ever having seen Maggie Dougherty. Then later he did admit that he had seen her. She had been in his house. But he said um, what had happened was she had died of natural causes. They'd been drinking. He, Hare, their wives. Dougherty came in and joined them. At some point he and Hare started to fight. The women ran to separate them. And next thing, you know, they cooled down. They looked around and they thought, gee, where's, where's Dougherty? She was nowhere to be found. On searching, they found her dead under the straw of the bed, lying against the wall, partly on her back and partly on her side. Um, there was vomit from her mouth, but no blood. She was still warm, but not breathing. It's a good story in many respects. As um, commentators have noticed, it actually gets the four of them together and gives them all a kind of an alibi. Uh, he didn't know at that point that Hare was going to undercut any alibi he might give him. And in fact, Burke, Burke uh, refused um, until after the trial to give any account to, to accuse Hare uh, or to accuse anyone of, um, of the actual murders. But even so, it's a story that was very clearly contradicted by the medical testimony. Um, Christensen later pointed it out. At 11, the woman, though intoxicated, Christensen dead, was sensible enough to be able to dance and sing. A few hours later, she was dead. Now, death from simple intoxication in so short a time was impossible because if it had happened that way, he would have been able to find some evidence of spirits uh, of alcohol in the stomach. The same would be true of death by suffocation, which was caused by falling into an awkward position or with the access of air to the lungs was mechanically obstructed. I mean, she would have had to fall down in some sort of awkward way so that her nose and mouth were obstructed and being too drunk to move herself. And so, again, there'd be some sign of that. Um, she certainly wouldn't have been able to crawl under the straw and get herself kind of half on her side and then suffocate. There isn't any way that that, that, that would have happened. And in fact, again, uh, modern forensic uh, experts would agree if you're, gonna, if you're gonna suffocate from intoxication, you choke on your own vomit or from your tongue, you'd, it's because you're on your back, not typically on your stomach. Um, so for that reason, Burke's story simply couldn't have been true. It turned out not to be essential um, to the case. Again, the case broke in other ways, but once again, we can see the forensics contradicting the story of a testimony and thus corroborating, supporting the prosecution's case. And I have, I have more uh, stories, but I've been told that I'm running out of time, so I will stop there. So in this respect, too, then, with forensic science being something that experts and you know, the criminal justice system has access to, 
but the perpetrators really don't. That gets us back again to the CSI. Uh, that's one of the features of uh, most of the CSI stories, with some exceptions, that typically the experts do know more. They can use their knowledge, they can use their science to, uh, to prove a case against, um, against a victim. Um, and um, I hope I managed to convince you that that did not start with Jerry Bruckheimer uh, or Anthony Zucker, but that, in fact, it has been part of the, uh, of the process of forensic medicine in the legal system for some time, at least in Edinburgh, and, and with you know, dramatic results. Legal scholars see this as the period when criminal justice system turned away from the use of spies and informers and thief takers, looking for more objective physical evidence. And I think the kind of thing that we've seen, uh, that we've seen in Edinburgh in the 1820s is very much a part of that larger system. Um, of course, the shift is recorded in the stories of uh, Edgar Allan Poe and Arthur Conan Doyle, but I think, again, as I hope I've convinced you, you can see it in the Burke and Hare case as well. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that's all I have to say, but I hope that you have questions that I'll be able to answer. Thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes. This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity, and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to rcpe.ac.uk slash heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you.